What is these? What? What structures make up the central nervous system? No, no, no. Brain and spinal cord. Yeah, I have all the answers on the board here. Brain and spinal cord. Well, the brain itself is a very complex, a name for a very complex structure that is made of, in turn, four main structures, four main regions, if you will, make up the brain. And those are, and we can check the spinal cord, actually, what I'm going to do. And this might be changes. To now, my little outline is in anatomical order. Well, I realize you can't see what I'm writing. I'm putting spinal cord on the bottom. The point is, central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. The brain is made up of four major regions, right? The brain stem, um, sorry, the brain stem, sorry, let me start. The brain is made of three major, re major regions. The brain stem, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. So in class last time, we took a closer look at the structures that make up the brain stem. And those are inferior to superior, the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, and the diencephalon. Okay. So I think, did we go into detail describing the thalamus? Yeah. Yeah, yeah thalamus. So we left off really completely describing the brain stem, which we've also seen in lab. We left off before we could take a closer look at the cerebellum. So again, here we see a picture of the brain itself. Okay, those three major regions. Cerebrum, which we're going to talk Cerebrum. about today. Cerebellum, which we're going to talk about today. And brain stem, which we talked about last time. Okay, so moving forward. The brain, sorry, the cerebellum itself literally means little brain. As you can see, it's very similar yeah. in structure to the cerebrum. It has the same gyri and sulci fold. What can you tell me about the ratio of gray matter to white matter in the cerebellum compared to the cerebrum? The cerebellum is mostly gray matter. What does that tell us about the cerebellum? Lots of neurons of cell bodies. Neuron cell bodies. You were so close. <laughs> <that time. laughs> Not ganglia. Ganglia is cell bodies out, outside the central nervous system. So it's neuron cell bodies inside the yeah. Inside the brain, right. Oh. Inside the central nervous system. Which is what the gray matter in the cortex of the brain is. The gray matter in the middle of the spinal cord is. Collections of the cell bodies of those. Again, what we'll see is, and there's some misinformation in the text, but make note of this because I will ask this up again. There are more neurons in the cerebellum than in the rest of the brain combined. Um, yeah, you see all gray matter. That's a packed full of primarily uh, neuron cell bodies. What's the major, major role of the cerebellum? This unique structure in section. We talked about the arbor vitae, the yeah, tree of light. Right? The arrangement of the white matter gives it a very true like branch and true like structure. What's the function of the cerebellum? Primarily, it's involved with this coordination, the smooth, the coordination of smooth muscle movement, right? Both voluntary skeletal muscle movement, but also some the coordination of tracking with eye movement, etc. Right? Involves neurons that have contained cell bodies found in the cerebellum. So again, I think we talked about this in the last yeah, okay. some individuals with damages to the cerebellum. For example, you look in the project, so it says right here, describing textures without looking at them. For example, if there is a, uh, I was thinking a, 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 a piece of velvet, like the first thing that came to mind, something smooth. Well, was the velvet smooth oh, okay. A piece of, uh, with an intact cerebellum, I could look at that, and I could think, you know, I bet that's going to feel smooth. Right? You're not going to feel sharp, right? It's not going to electrocute you, et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing how some people damage the cerebellum could look at the structure, even touch it, it could feel that it's smooth, but not be able to make sense of what you're feeling, conceive the fact that it's so be involved in some sensory um, input evaluation, complex processing of sensory information in, as well as complex kind of processing of motor information, right? Controlling skeletal muscles, right? Kind of helps control that information up. Again, did we talk about this? Alcohol, right? Ethyl alcohol, 
dramatically inhibits neurons found in the cerebellum, which is why when people are intoxicated, smooth, coordinated muscle contraction is, di is difficult, which is why, again, the field sobriety test will ask you to close your eyes, touch your fingers, do you know? That involves an incredible amount of some in primarily kind of inhibition override from the cerebellum, keeping motor units that don't need to contract from over contracting, creating these herky jerky contractions, or really kind of the, the inability to match kind of sensory to motor commands. One of the main roles of the cerebellum. Um, it says comparing spectrums without looking at them, but you just said that you can't. It's like dangerous. Oh, if da basically damage to the cerebellum would make that task more difficult. Oh, so for example, oh. maybe a better example is feeling a piece of smooth velvet, I don't know, feeling a pile of broken glass. Oh my Dramatic God. example, but with an, the ability to close your eyes and feel those two structures, I mean, it, it sounds like a simple task, right? That involves neurons in the cerebellum. If those aren't functioning correctly, it's amazing. Somebody might be able to look at those two piles and say, oh, that looks like smooth velvet. This is sharp glass, but without the visual cues, Right, relying just on feel. In this case, the cerebellum isn't functioning properly. That patient might be able to look at it and tell me smooth versus sharp. But feeling it, it, it doesn't travel to the brain because of the damage to the cerebellum. <clears throat> um, again, a lot of your eye movement, right? Again, the ability to track eye movement, some eye reflexes, right? Which is oftentimes when you hear loud noise, oftentimes you clench away and stare at it. Some of those reflex arts involve neurons that originate in the cerebellum. Hearing, like the, we'll talk about hearing next week, but distinguishing different pitch and different sounds. For example, the ability, for example, in a dog park where there's 20 dogs running around, the ability to hear your dog's bark and distinguish your dog's bark or your kid's cry, maybe is a better example, right? Distinguishing pitches and associating pitch with right, the source, right? a lot of complex processing dealing with the cerebellum. Okay. Pretty anatomically unique structure. It's a major regulator of motor signals out and a lot of special sensory information. Okay. So next, I realize this is slightly out of order. We did yeah. this already. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you, yeah. thank you. So, oh, great. Yeah. We're on the mystery trap. And oh, there okay, go. fantastic, thanks. Yeah. I'll save us a couple extra minutes. Okay, so then, then three, so up to this point then, why I, I tended to, to switch colors here. So last week, or last class, we talked about the medulla, pons, midbrain. Okay, so it sounds like we've already talked about the entire diaphragm. Mm -hmm. We know that it's made of the epithalamus, thalamus, mm -hmm. hypothalamus. One thing I did want to point out, I'm not sure if I clarified this, how do people look at most images of the brain show the sagittal section. And it's really hard to distinguish thalamus, hypothalamus, yeah. and hypothalamus. Yeah. It just looks like every, in this representation, every line pointing to the thalamus is really pointing smack into the middle of the, what? Right in the middle yeah, of the third dimension. Yeah, yeah. The thalamus is not just a little tiny dot here. It is it kind of, it, to me, I think of the thalamus, the two thalamic bodies, it's kind of the, almost like a big mushroom cap on top of the brain, which you can't appreciate at all from this perspective, but there are a couple images that do show it that way. So see what I mean here? See how that looks more like, kind of looks like a little brain on top of the brain stem? Um, bear with me, I'm gonna scroll forward a couple slides. Since I saw, yeah, actually, I'm gonna scroll back. Don't wanna ruin this time. There's another, there's another image near the very front of this presentation. Here we go. Oh. Okay, you can see that the thalamus itself, it's two, two pretty large masses of nervous tissue that sit right on top of the, what does the diencephalon sit on top of? Midbrain. Diencephalon sits on top uh, of the midbrain, midbrain, right? But it's not just, so therefore where is the third ventricle? <laughs> Right in the middle, yeah. you know, the thalamus itself is a big mass of tissue, nervous <laughs> tissue, right at the top of the brainstem. So see what I mean? It's kind of this mushroom cap on top of the brainstem itself. That is the thalamus. 
category function. Yeah. Period. Okay, so again, from that image, it doesn't all in any way, shape, or form resemble the actual size and scale of the thalamus. On the next slide, right, and I really like the next slide, it actually shows a, a clear breakout between the three parts of the brain. The brain stem, shown in yellow, medulla, tongue, midbrain, diencephalon, cerebellum, and then lastly, the cerebrum, which is where we're at now. Okay, so we've talked about all of these structures except for the cerebrum. Now, we've already looked at these structures in lab. I think we've had one day, maybe even two days already in lab to look at these brain structures. So we can go through the anatomy um, fairly quickly. By now, everyone should be able to distinguish the gyri from the sulci, which is a prominent protrusion of tissue and which is a depression of tissue. Bulk is the gyri, sulcus is the depression. Right? You sulk yama. When you sulk, you sink down low. <laughs> sulcus. Okay. What's the difference between a sulcus and a fissure? Fissure deeper. Deeper, typically wider. The fissure is just a larger depression in the, uh, in the tissue. Okay. In this case, it would be cerebral cortex. So we see the cerebrum itself broken down into two cerebral hemispheres. Right and left hemispheres, each hemisphere, okay, the cortex of each hemisphere, okay, formed by these gyri and sulci, these sitting bumps and grooves, and that thick bundle of white tissue again. What, what structures or what, where do you find myelinated axons in the brain, the in the matter. cerebrum, in the white matter? Specifically, what makes up white matter? Nerves? Well, no. oligodendrocytes myelinate those axons. The point is, axons in the brain and spinal cord run in tracks. Outside the brain and spinal cord, they run in yeah. nerves. So the point is, there's one distinct nerve track called the corpus callosum, okay, which here in this image is shown section. Okay. This nerve track contains millions, billions of myelinated axons sending information from one cerebral hemisphere over to the other and, and vice versa. Okay. So in order to separate the cerebral hemispheres, you have to cut through the <coughs> corpus callosum, which then cuts right into the thalamus, right to the third ventricle, all the way down to the brainstem, et cetera. Okay, so the cerebral, right, the cerebral itself, two hemispheres, each hemisphere, right, is divided anatomically and to some extent functionally into what five different lobes. Most of these lobes, four of the five, are named after the cranial bones that they're found deep to. Frontal lobe found deep to the frontal bone, parietal lobe deep to the parietal bone, etc. Now, again, functionally, we're going to talk a lot about differences in these functional regions of the brain. So the frontal lobe. Neurons found in the frontal lobe play a major role with mood, motivation, Emotion, um, aggression, foresight, right? The ability to budget your checkbook, knowing that rent's due next month, right? That, those skills involve neurons in, in the frontal lobe. Again, how do we know this? Primarily by looking at what happens when people suffer damages to these areas, right? These dramatic changes, right? Lead, lead scientists to understand how different areas of the brain work. Right? For example, somebody suffering from a stroke, because of the ruptured blood vessel, the frontal lobe is going to experience dramatically different symptoms than somebody who suffers a stroke or blunt force trauma to the cerebrum or the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. Right? Different areas of the brain have vastly different functions. Okay? The frontal lobe, again, as listed here, voluntary motor functions, all voluntary motor functions, right? the ability to flex my elbows, right? talk, stand upright, that all involve neurons in the frontal lobe. We'll look at that in much more detail here, or in the next couple slides. The parietal lobe, all general sensory information and some special sensory information ultimately travels back to and innervates with neurons found in the parietal lobe. Okay. Taste, some, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at what's listed here. General sensory information, parietal lobe. Voluntary motor information starts with neurons in the frontal lobe. The occipital lobe is exclusively associated with vision. 
We're gonna describe it as the primary visual cortex. So if light enters the eye, hits the rods and cones, the action potential that's generated travels down the optic nerve, ultimately travels to neurons whose cell bodies are found in the occipital lobe. The temporal lobe okay, is primarily associated with hearing, smell, learning, memory components, as well as emotion. We're gonna talk about the limbic system, functional region of the brain that's associated with mood, aggression, etc. Some of those structures are found in the temporal lobe. In the insula, the deep lobe can only be seen if the temporal lobe is kind of pulled behind. There aren't many of our models in lab that should actually show the insula. But again, um, the insula and temporal lobe, and in this region of the brain, where a lot of taste, hearing, and um, speech function is, is regulated by neurons found in the brain. We know that somebody suffers a stroke, a ruptured blood vessel, that kills nervous tissue in this region, chances are they're gonna have difficulty speaking. Somebody has a, a stroke that causes a ruptured blood vessel that damages tissue back in this region, they're more than likely gonna suffer some uh, visual uh, defects. So often symptoms, right, the patient's symptoms in certain cases can dr dramatically help the physician pinpoint where the damage is occurring. Right? It's amazing how regionalized uh, brain tissue is in terms of function. So I had a question. So um, there's like instances where people have like an English, um, uh, American accent, and then when, after like brain surgery or something, they start speaking yeah. in like a British accent. There was accent. a recent case of that. I think, it was, I, I think it was an American man. Don't quote me on that, but he suffered some sort of brain injury. I don't know if it was surgery, a car crash, what, but he came out of his coma. He had a thick British accent. He had no idea where it came from. You hear these stories about somebody who suffers some sort of brain injury, they come out, of, they recover, and all of a sudden they can paint like Picasso. Right? It, the brain is such a huge mystery. We're just scratching the surface. There's so much more than brain function that we don't know. So I don't know how to explain that. All I can think of is that there's so much complex wiring and synapsing, some excitatory, some inhibitory, that some areas of the brain that control mainly the inhibition of other areas of the brain. Well, if that area gets damaged, then one area of the brain that should be inhibited is overstimulated. And if that happens to be a part of the brain that, I don't know, for some reason, makes you speak with an English accent or gives you the ability to draw like Picasso, it's such a huge mystery. Um, but I think along that those lines, if if the person like let's say they took like an acting class and they learned how to speak yeah there has to be some deep yeah. deep deep seed to that yeah you're not just going to wake up and start speaking yeah. vietnamese if you've never heard vietnamese in your life for example, right but just along those lines um here in seattle uh paul allen right, co-founder of microsoft owner of the seahawks trailblazers the richest man richest humans on the planet he's starting a on the paul allen research for the paul allen brain institute for research into exploring a lot of the mysteries of the brain that science hasn't really unlocked. So some of the, the potentially largest breakthroughs in understanding central nervous system are gonna come from uh, Seattle, right downtown Seattle. So I was um, watching a show actually last week and I, um, it, it, there was somebody that had a brain injury and then woke up from <coughs> surgery and could, couldn't remember how to speak in English. They started speaking their native language, which was, which was Vietnamese. Oh, yeah. And I, it made me think, is this really true? And I went and looked it up. So it's similar to what you're talking about. And there are instances where that happens is they just forget yeah. or are unable to yeah, access that. that. Like, yeah. Yeah. We all have amazing ability to um, forget. Mm -hmm. right? there, and there, there are some recorded cases of people who yeah. cannot forget anything. Mm -hmm. That, that may sound really cool right now, right? Yeah. I'm making life yeah. a little easier. Yeah. No, I would rather be a stumbling moron. Like yeah. Is this the show called like Night Shift? Yeah. So yeah. the point is that a lot of time in addition, right? That those inhibitions are lifted. It's essentially overstimulating. So, yeah, it's such a big mystery. Okay, so, so again, and there are a lot of neuropsychology, biopsychology, psychology classes talk about brain anatomy almost at the same level we do to understand brain function, you have to understand brain anatomy. So 
lot of those questions and answers are, are solved by psychologists and neuropsychologists, etc. Okay, so again, um, a lot of this material here is reviewed. So the cerebrum itself contains gray matter, white matter. Where do we find gray matter in the cerebrum? Cortex. Primarily in the cortex, as shown here. Here we see gray matter in the cortex. The entire cortex is gray matter, but all, all gray matter is in the cortex. Right? Cortex is all gray. Most of the cerebrum, each cerebral hemisphere, is mostly white matter. The inner core is mostly white matter. Again, white matter runs through tracts. These aren't nerves, these are tracts. Now, Within that white matter are several clusters of gray matter, cell bodies. These are called nuclei. Right? So a cluster of gray matter that is not in the cortex is a nucleus. I hate that term, but it's, yeah. Inside one cell is a nucleus. Millions of cells together is also a nucleus. I, it's, it's ridiculous terminology, but it is what it is. So the point is, basal nuclei are to the cerebrum what blank are to spinal nerves. The ganglia. Yeah. The ganglia is a collection of cell bodies outside the brain and spinal cord. In the brain and spinal cord, you find gray matter in the cerebral cortex, the basal nuclei, and the gray matter butterfly of the spinal cord. Okay. We talk about the fact that we talk about the fact that the brain stem okay, is basically you notice functionally speaking. Whoops. Forget that. <laughs> Everything beneath the cerebrum mm -hmm. is almost exclusively involved in autonomic involuntary control. Heart rate, respiration, thirst, hunger, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's really only the cerebrum where we find neurons that are involved in more complex processes, thoughts, memory. While those are involuntary, so to speak. The point is. Um, a lot of these, the regulation of heart rate, a lot of the regulation of respiratory rate, blood vessel diameter, right? These are reflexes, right? We know that in the spinal cord, the cell bodies of neurons involved in these reflex are, are found in the gray matter of the spinal cord. Well, there is no spinal cord other than the brain. The cell bodies of the neurons involved in many of those are sensory to motor reflexes, right? We tested the pupillary light reflex, right? And uh, so light hits the eye, activates your rods and cones, that sensory information travels into the brain where it synapses with neurons that eventually go out to the people and cause them to empty and constrict. Well, the cell bodies, we find those cell bodies involved in those synapses in these basal nuclei. So basically, the basal nuclei, the gray matter, in the deep brain and brain stem, is kind of the equivalent to the H-shaped butterfly in the spinal cord. Right? It's just called a cluster of gray matter, contains cell bodies, Okay. Most gray matter is in the cortex, but there are these basal nuclei. Okay. Containing cell bodies, synapses with, with neurons that are involved in many of these reflexes. Okay, so next, the limbic system. So, the limbic system, much like the reticular formation we talked about before, which is that kind of anatomically undefined area in the brain center, <laughs> the reticular formation, first of all. What is the reticular formation? Where do you find it? What does it do? Yeah. Yeah. Through everything, so meaning. Around. No. Let's go I back real quick. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't rule you out. I was waiting for your answer. So, <laughs> here in red, these red arrows are referring to the reticular formation. Again, an anatomically kind of ambiguous, unidentifiable network of neurons in the brain stem that, as you can see here, are primarily involved with, as you can see here, motor control, right? Motor coordination as well, and somatic motor control. What does that mean, somatic motor control? Motor control of your muscles, bones, skin, right? Somatic is body, not visceral, right? This isn't talking about control of your stomach, your internal organs, control of your muscles to control balance, posture. So the reticular formation in the brain stem and didn't we just get done describing how important the cerebellum is to regulating motor control, et cetera? Which is why, oh, I thought this would be a little bit more dramatic. Yeah. Oftentimes, 
the images show the reticular formation and the cerebellum more closely um, uh, linked with, with synapses. The point is, both the cerebellum and neurons in the brainstem collectively help again, adjust muscle tension to maintain, help, again, ensure that your eyes constantly stay fixed without you constantly having to attempt to keep your eyes from wandering back and forth, little things like that. The ability to maintain smooth, coordinated muscle contraction, whether that's contraction with a lot of strength and force or not, okay, involve these structures. So again, there's this more of a functional entity within the brainstem called the reticular formation that helps regulate smooth, primarily autonomic skeletal muscle contraction control. There's a similar type of, to some extent, unambiguous network of neurons in the cerebrum okay, that make up what's called the limbic system. Okay, as you can see here, this is important with emotion and learning. So let me scroll forward to one slide and then I'll go back. So what do I mean by emotion? Well, again, your gratification centers, right? Your pleasure centers in the brain. Um, areas in the brain that help you, again, understand aversion or understanding that uh, something as simple as if I don't pay my rent, I will get kicked out of my apartment and that's a bad thing. I mean, that, that's obviously simple. It sounds kind of patronizing, but the point is the ability to process something like that is incredibly complex. Can you think of any other animal on the planet that can process information that way, right? Dogs. No. Most animals have basic predatory instincts, knowing that if I'm if, if a shark is coming my way, my instincts tell me to run away. Yeah. But the fishes think, well, if I stay here, what are my chances? No, they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> Much of that, again, not just a ver version of gratification, right? So studies have shown that some people with very addictive behaviors, right? Uh, uh, people addicted to gambling, real seekers, oftentimes have over or under activity in these regions of the brain. So what, what I'm really trying to get at, the major portion of this limbic system can be kind of defined anatomically. So here we see that corpus callosum, a bundle of nerve fibers collecting the right and left cerebral hemisphere. Just above it is the beginning of the cerebrum, shown here. So notice how most of the cerebral cortex is bumpy and groovy, right, the gyri and so kind. Well, just above the corpus callosum, there's a relatively smooth area of the cerebral cortex that's called the cingulate gyrus. And what is a gyrus? One kind of bony bone, or protrusion of tissue. Well, this is just a longitudinal bone with not many sulci in it. Neurons whose cell bodies are found here, in part of the frontal lobe, and in regions of the deep temporal lobe and insula, neurons found in these regions <coughs> of the brain are associated with these, again, feelings of emotion, okay, memory, okay, and learning. And we know that when people suffer damages to these areas of the brain, they suffer dramatic losses in uh, oftentimes control over mood. So you get oftentimes people who are thrill seekers, right? You know, the people who don't even, you know, the heart rate doesn't even go up when they're you know, jumping out of an airplane, for example. <laughs> oftentimes, you know, studies show that, that, that the need to be afraid of certain things is a pretty important aspect of evolution and, and, and success. Some people just don't. Often it has to do with dysfunction in some of these regions of the brain. What caused that, you know, developmental, um, who knows. But um, now keep in mind, the hippocampus and amygdala, these are regions of the temporal lobe, regions of the um, primarily deep temporal lobe and insula that we're not gonna see on any of our models in lab. That's why they're not on the, the master list. But how do they get damaged if they're so far deep into the brain? Um, lack of blood supply to the oh, brain. Okay. Maybe somebody has a tumor, uh, a ruptured blood vessel. Um, severe blunt force trauma could cause it, but typically it's something internal. Yeah. Meningitis. Is there um, any way to fix it? Like, what's healthier? healthier no, cell? typically not. In yeah. theory, that stem cell therapy could lead to that, but as of now, no. I mean, there might be some sort of electric stimulation therapy, I don't know, I've only started Yeah. Sometimes they even exist Yeah, there very well might, yeah, it's like that poor impulse easy. control yeah. in kids or in adults might be controlled through inactivity in certain regions of these brain, uh, uh, of the brain. 
So some behavior therapies, some drug, um, some drugs may may help. In those cases, I, I, I don't know. On the flip side of that, would somebody that is super afraid of everything, would that yes. be in the same place or would that be causing? It very something? well could be. I, again, I'm only speculating, right. but it could be overactivity here or underactivity somewhere else that this links with. Um, and then, and a lot of it is in that case, behaviors are also you know, dramatically based on you know, personal experience. So it's probably a combination of both. So basically, that doesn't mean that every thrill seeker has a damaged limbic system, right? Maybe some people just right. experience that. I, I really like this. This is the greatest thing on earth, so I'm just going to keep doing so. Right. And, <laughs> and that's what's so complex about psychology of the nervous system. So we have anatomy exclusively nervous system, but psychology and behavior and the link between where they come together is such a big gray area that again, that's what psychologists are for. Okay, so again, the limbic system, can you hear that term? It's primarily associated with you know, memory, okay, but emotion, okay, fear, pleasure, aversion, gratification. Right? So again, studies show that certain drugs, illegal or legal, right, drugs that are stimulants, drugs that are mood accelerators. Right, tend to dramatically activate neurons in these regions of the brain. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this is kind of what I was leading up to. We talked about upper brain function or integrated brain function, right? That's primarily involving right, neurons in the cerebral. Again, memory, cognition, right? Making, like, making sense of um, the world around us. Language, emotion, right? Functions, skills that no other being in the known universe, aside from humans, have. We, of all animals, certainly on the planet, humans have the largest cerebrum, right? In pound per pound, or per square inch, so to speak, the ratio, right? The human brain, the cerebrum, is dramatically larger than the human brain than any other animal on the planet, right? This, and you can dramatically look at the shape, the size, the brain in non-human primates that really clearly get an understanding of human evolution, right? Primate evolution and brain, specifically cerebral size, are directly correlated. Okay. So the point is upper brain function, integrated brain function, emotion, sensation, right? Fish don't have feelings. You've heard that before, right? Um, it's true, they don't have feelings, they do not have the brain capacity. To actually feel happy, feel bad. they're simply running on brainstem, just built in reflex loops, right? That guide their entire existence. The evolution of the cerebrum led to, right, a much more advanced animal, ultimately us, the human being. Sensations, complex processing of sensations, complex motor control, memories, and again, a lot of this involves, as I mentioned before, sensory receptors, right, from the periphery. Neurons in the brain out of the cortex and synapse with nuclei, nuclei in the base of the brain stem, etc. In order to simply speak, it involves complex processing between many different air regions of both brains collectively. A lot of complex, incredibly complex, converging, diverging, crossing over from one side of the brain to the other, etc. In terms of kind of controlling these upper level brain functions. So cognition, right? Well, humans aren't necessarily the only animals on the, on, on the planet that, that are capable of cognition, right? There aren't too many animals out there that are, right? There aren't too many non-mammalian species on the planet that are capable of cognition. Again, what is cognition? Again, thought, reasoning, understanding, right? That judgment, imagination, intuition, right? Cognition, this involves incredibly complex network of neurons that are primarily found in the cerebrum. Okay. You look at it again, fish pretty much has no cerebrum. Fish is just pretty much brainstem and spinal. Okay. <laughs> Truly, right? that's what a primitive animal, primitive nervous system really is. So what we're gonna see is, you know, we already described how the different lobes, right? Occipital lobe, vision, frontal lobe, personality, foresight, thought, judgment, right? These different cognitive tasks, functions are controlled by, regulated by different regions of the brain. Those areas are fairly 
fairly well understood. So what we're going to see here, um, uh, first of all, here's just a little bit more information about the hippocampus, the structure, and the deep temporal lobe. It begins involved in the limbic system, memory, and emotional fear, but also memory. I'm not skipping over this fairly quickly. Just know that the limbic system right, plays a role in memory and those emotions that we talked about before. Oh, um, oh. said something about, uh, in the last slide, um, something about does not store memories. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, basically, I'm not gonna ask you anything specifically about this. It just, the book will go into to more detail to explain it, but the whole process of memory, of forming a memory. So I think we talked about this in class, but we know that obviously storing memories involves action potential as a brain activity. We know that causing muscles to contract voluntarily involves right, neuron activity. So the million dollar question is, okay, how is something like a thought, okay, I think I need to pick up this pen. How does something like a thought, a non-physical entity, turn into generation of electricity? Or at the same time, how does me touching hot stove, right? We can understand how that physical heat can generate an action potential in the neuron, but how does that turn into a thought, a memory of don't touch that hot stove again because it hurt last time, it'll hurt again. So that, again, it's still such a, a huge mystery, but scientists do know that there are a few different regions in the brain that are responsible for forming memory and storing memory. And there's short-term memory, long-term memory. So for example, um, yeah, there are some things you can remember and you can remember really well for five, 10 minutes and then they're just gone. Different areas of the brain become more active when the brain is trying to form longer-term memories. Regardless of whether you're forming a short-term memory or long-term memory, studies show that in both cases, neurons in the hippocampus in the hippocampus become more active, but then by themselves they'll store the memory. Typically memory storage is occurring in upper cerebral, primarily cerebral cortex areas. Like the frontal lobe? Or, or yeah, in the frontal lobe. Um, and I, that's one area I kind of skipped over. Um, and that's something that talked about in much more detail than most psychology or neuropsychology classes. But just know that, um, yeah, memory is one of those complex upper brain function, right? That involves a lot of different areas of the brain, not just right, <coughs> one small part of the temporal lobe, that is the hippocampus. Oh yeah, it's very good. Ultimately, it is the cerebral cortex that, that, that forms those oh, long-term memories. So again, somebody suffers a tumor, a stroke, blunt force trauma that damages the temporal lobe, right? They very well may have difficulty, right? with their short-term and or long-term memory. Okay, so this is really interesting. Classic, classic case of understanding functions of the brain. So, Phineas Gage is one of the most classic cases in all of medical documentation, or medical case studies. So back in the 1800s, I wanna say around 1850s, don't quote me on that, but there was this rail, railroad worker uh, who was a railroad, railroad construction worker, typo there, um, named Phineas Gage, who um, suffered some horrific accident, accident while you know, building a railroad line. And so a giant rail spike somehow ended up getting projected, as you can see here, right into his face, up smack through the middle of his frontal lobe. And what's remarkable about, remarkable about this is this guy, Phineas, he, the, the reports go, was the nicest guy. Like, he's the guy you'd want to marry your daughter or have next door, just the nicest guy uh, in the world. And after this injury, his demeanor changed dramatically. He was just the, the, the exact opposite. The guy you would not want a million years to live next door to. Was just grossly profane, couldn't, couldn't um, balance, you know, hey, I've checked what's in 1850. Yeah. You understand what I'm getting at? His personality had changed dramatically. You may think, well, yeah, if I had a spike shoved in my forehead, I'd probably get pretty upset too. But it was it was much more dramatic than that. It was really the first indication that damage to a specific area of the brain has very specific symptoms, or if you will, right? So, for example, lobotomy. Lobotomy. What is a lobotomy? Yeah, it's a 
think of them. They may still be used that I really don't know, but it was believed that hyperactivity or dysfunction of the frontal lobe was responsible for criminal activity. Right? And there's some some truth to that, but it was very common, and a lot of this has been been um, rule barbaric and been outdated for decades. <coughs> that you could destroy the frontal lobe. And by destroying the frontal lobe, you could essentially inhibit somebody's over-aggressive, over-violent tendencies. So a lobotomy, more specifically, a frontal lobotomy, as disgusting as it sounds, the physician, the surgeon would go in with either a scalpel or an electrode, literally up into the nasal cavity, piercing the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, and literally with a a uh, probe or an electrode or a scalpel, literally shove it up in through the nose, breaking into the cranium, and literally scrambling the, the frontal lobe. Right? So basically, oftentimes turning people comatose. I did the trick, they're not out there creating crimes, but it was kind of considered barbaric. Right? There are other means that could, but the point is, a dramatic example of the functional. Uh, differences of different regions of the brain. Okay. So. Yeah, so back in 91, my mom said there was a new brain injury. And okay. Completely different person, but when she first woke up, she didn't know she had kids, she didn't know she had okay. mother, she couldn't remember anything. Okay. And even like after a while, her mood just changed. She was completely a different person. Okay, and this is from a car crash, she said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you know where she was hit? I don't even know what size of my front seat, and I was oh, young. Wow. So okay. She was on top, so I think probably. Yeah, it's very common for yeah. car crashes to have side impact mm -hmm. or front impact in both cases. It's oftentimes the frontal lobe where a lot of memories and mood is, is controlled. So yeah, it, it's quite common. That Phineas Gage was a maybe more dramatic <laughs> example of that same thing, but mm. yeah, it's up. You you have some some personal experience. Oh, yeah. And it's more than just, oh yeah, well I'd be upset too if I got in a car crash. Yeah, I get that yeah, it really is. is a a commonly seen phenomenon of occurrence. The damage in those areas of the brain have those effects. So again, that's really how we know because scientists can't just open up someone's brain and you know, yeah. you know play with it and then hey, tell me what happens. Yeah. And oftentimes what we know comes from looking at injuries, diseases, etc. She couldn't even balance her book, but she can't even work anymore yeah. because of it. Yeah, it's really sad. I have a student at uh, Seattle Central who was in a car crash 20 years ago while she was a student. And uh, over the last 20 years, yeah, her, her cognitive ability is vastly diminished. And yeah, that's one of the, 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 the most difficult things about those types of injuries is because the brain doesn't look any different upon x-ray. A lot of, you know, veterans, you know, combat mm -hmm. soldiers, mm -hmm. you know, s suffer these symptoms that can uh, there's no physical difference to the brain. I mean, it's such a huge mystery. For a lot of diseases you can match and see the disease. <laughs> so, brain oftentimes you can. So now moving on the next few slides talk really primarily about these kind of functional regions of the brain. So then we'll talk about the cerebrum. Let's take a closer look at the cerebral cortex. Now what we're going to see here, let me scroll forward a couple slides and then I'll come back. We see here that the cerebrum, again, we're looking superficially, we're specifically looking at the cerebral cortex, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe. Well, within each lobe, there are several functional areas. Now again, if you look at a model of a brain, it's just a big gray mass. You can't absolutely 100% identify the boundaries of these functional areas, but we know that different lobes of the brain control contain neurons that control vastly different functions, right? Frontal lobe, right? Mood, balancing a checkbook, behavior, etc. We're gonna describe that the occipital lobe, right, we already described it briefly, is exclusively associated with processing visual information. Well, you've already saw this in lab. All right, what's the name of this deep groove that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe? The central sulcus. The central sulcus not only serves as an anatomical boundary between the two lobes, but all of the neurons in the, what we call the prefrontal sulcus or the primary motor sulcus, the neurons that control voluntary 
skeletal muscle movement are all found here. All general sensory information. When I touch hot stove, all that information travels back to the brain and it innervates with neurons found here. So there's a specific primary motor cortex, a specific primary sensory cortex, sometimes called the somatosensory cortex. There is a, a region in the temporal lobe okay, and a region in the frontal lobe, Broca area and Wernicke area, that are associated with speech. The ability to not only think and form a word in your mind, but the ability to actually formulate and produce sound, right? Involve neurons found in those regions. So the next few slides can describe these functional reasons in a little more detail. So again, not only are there general sensory cortex, there's a general motor cortex, there's a visual cortex in the occipital lobe. There are specific regions of the brain that are associated with general senses and the special senses. Right? Again, vision. Vision information is processed by neurons in the occipital lobe. Hearing. Hearing is processed by neurons that are primarily in the temporal lobe, in the lobe deep to that, the insula. Um, taste and smell. Right? These are also processed by neurons in the temporal lobe. So again, comparing that to, sorry, the picture, that's just what it's showing us. Here we see an auditory cortex, hearing. Most hearing is regulated by neurons found in the temporal lobe. The gustatory cortex, taste cortex. And that's insula too? Um, yeah, so sorry, let's go back here. Um, yeah. Is it taste as insula? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that homework, those questions are growing into a little bit more detail than I'm going to ask. Um, I'm looking at the Yeah, just kind of going off of what, what I have listed here. So, well, yeah, sometimes the book, and certainly the book, sometimes the homework may hold a little more detail. Um, definitely go off of it here. So I was just looking through this really quickly. Oh, here we go. It does say temporal lobe and insula oh, for hearing. Yeah, I know I, I'd seen that. So this image here, is it showing the insula? Because again, the insula is deep to the temporal lobe. Okay. But just know that, that the tissue kind of works its way deep. Neurons found there also are involved with hearing. So again, speech, hearing, motor movement, general sensation, vision, taste, hearing, olfaction, smell. Again, these functional areas are fairly well mapped out. Okay, so now one thing I wanted to draw your attention to, you've probably seen this before. Okay. Okay, not only are the functional areas well mapped out, but within certain functional areas, the actual more specific distribution functionally of neurons is well mapped out. In this case, general sensory and somatic motor information is so well mapped out, it's mapped out in, in, in what's often presented as a homunculus. One of my favorite words in all of anatomy is you You have some words you just don't like saying, and some words you just like saying homunculus. I don't know what it is. Infundibulum. Yeah, yeah, that's fun too. Yeah, homunculus. There's just something about that word. I love it. But the point is, what this is representing is scientists, surgeons, been able to kind of map out the brain. And so here we're seeing a general sensory homunculus. Where is the general sensory cortex, specifically? Okay, which lobe contains the general sensory cortex? No, not the frontal lobe. It's the, sorry, sensory cortex, is the beginning of the parietal lobe. Motor, frontal. So think of it this way, there's a little trick with this. Right? Remember the spinal cord. What type of information enters the spinal cord from the back, and what type enters it from the front? What enters through the back? So therefore, all motor travels out the front, same thing here. Sensory is in the back, 
motor is in the front. Uh, the point is, not only do we know that all general sensory information is regulated here, it's regulated in a highly kind of anatomically uh, organized manner. So for example, how did scientists figure this out? Well, in actuality, during brain surgery, a scientist has a little electrode to apply an electrical stimulus to the brain. During brain surgery, the patient is alert, right, cognizant, then a physician can apply an electrode to that region of the brain. In a, in a pa it, sorry, I scrolled ahead to the motor homunculus. Bear with me. If a physician, a brain surgeon, applies an electrode right here to that region of the primary sensory cortex of the parietal lobe, the patient will feel, it feels like somebody's touching my toes. It feels like my toes are burning or my toes are itchy. They move the electrode a millimeter up, the patient feels, oh, now it's in my shin, now it's in my knee, now it's in my thigh, now it's in my hip, now it's in my trunk. It's amazing how the brain is almost anatomically organized the same way that your, your body is, with some exception. Now notice, why on earth is the face so huge here? What is this representing? What is this telling us? More sensory. There are many more sensory receptors in your face, so therefore there is much more brain tissue, more cerebral cortex needed to house cell bodies to process that information. Um, I don't know if we did it in this lab. Did we do the two-point discrimination test? Well, there's this phenomenon we do at this lab in Central. If you take well, just two toothpicks or caliper, right? Something you can separate the distance, you can measure it. It's amazing how when you take two, 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 pick, two toothpicks, let's say they're separated by an inch, right? Poke somebody with those two toothpicks. Most people will tell you, I feel two pokes. Well, you bring those closer together, there comes a point when two pokes, even sometimes millimeters apart, in some areas of the body, you poke a patient, they can tell you, oh, it's only one. So, for example, areas of the back of the calf, some people you can take two toothpicks and poke them an inch apart and they'll swear I only feel one poke. Well there aren't nearly as many general sensory receptors on the skin and the back of your calf as there are on your lips, your eyes, your face, right? And that's exactly what that shows. This is Jeff telling us there are more sensory neurons in your pinky than there are in your entire calf, for example. Right? So clearly, hands, right? There's much more sensory information associated with the hand than the thigh, for example. Okay. And it's amazing how mapped out it is, and the scale, the distribution is not anatomically correct, but it's functionally accurate. Okay. So, since we get the same thing with the electrode, tap, tap a patient's brain with electrode here, and they will feel that oh, it feels like somebody's touching my thumb, for example. It's amazing how most of our brains are all kind of wired this way. Just like a quick question. So like um, he he a headache or whatever, um, mm -hmm. that's, does that involve sensory receptors? In any way? Oh, absolutely. So there are pain receptors in the brain, primarily around the blood vessels in the brain. So a headache can be caused with dehydration, blood force trauma, hangover, yeah. The buildup of metabolic waste products in the brain can activate pain receptors. So yeah, oftentimes a, a headache is coming from pain receptors deep in the brain itself. I just want to ask that. So if you have a headache, let's say the surgical, does that mean that like your toe, there's something wrong? Like what, what does that exactly mean? Like when you... Well, I, it, 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 it kind of depends. Um, I mean, what's the pain? Did you just get punched in the forehead? I mean, I, that makes sense. So, like, is it coming from a tumor? You know, I, it really depends. But let's say you get stung 